Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's guest is Peter Turchin. Peter's a complexity scientist, and he's a project leader at the Complexity Science Hub of Vienna. He's also a research associate at the University of Oxford, an emeritus professor at the University of Connecticut. He is a founder, he says, but he's actually the founder, best I can tell, of the field of cleodynamics, which we'll talk a fair bit about later. And he's also the editor-in-chief of the journal Cleodynamics. It's actually a wonderful pleasure to have you here today. Welcome aboard, Peter. Thank you, Jim. Yep. Peter probably didn't know this, but I've been a reader of his work for a long while. And even more interesting, one of his earlier books, Historical Dynamics, Why States Rise and Fall, was a very important piece of thinking that helped synthesize the early Game B movement, which we often talk about on the show. I'm not going to talk about it much today, but many, many people in the Game B world have read that book. And I looked on my Amazon historical log, and I saw that I had sent six copies of it to various people at various times. When I told Peter that, I saw him go, oh, yeah, right? You know, the author loves to hear about sales of his books. So I'll go back there. I also very much enjoyed a book on a similar theme on war and peace and war, the rise and fall of empires. And most recently, I read Ultra Society, how 10,000 years of war made humans the greatest cooperators on Earth. And today, we're going to be talking about Peter's newest book, End Times, Elites, Counter-Elites, and the Path of Political Disintegration. So, let's start with what is cleodynamics? Well, cleodynamics is essentially a science of history. The motivation behind proposing this uh, scientific discipline is uh, twofold. First of all, I was trained as a theoretical biologist And about 25 years ago, I felt that I needed more challenge, essentially. And so I switched from studying the population dynamics of animals, such as insects, uh, lemmings, deer, to the historical dynamics of human societies. At that time, history was really the last discipline which has not been rigorously submitted to the scientific method. There There were and there still are lots of theories that explain various things, but there was uh, at that time no systematic program for testing those theories against data and rejecting some in favor of others. So that was my primary motivation. But the secondary motivation is that we live in this wonderful large-scale societies organized as states, And such societies are in principle capable of providing broadly based well-being to uh, their populations. However, as we know from the study of history, almost inevitably in the past, at least, these societies have run into end times, periods of social dysfunction, political disintegration, sometimes leading to outright collapse, but not always. So the question becomes why? And this is, a, this is a very important question. We have a science of human health because we want to keep our bodies healthy. You have a science of ecology and environmental science because we want to live in healthy environments. But how come we don't have a science of social health? Because after all, most of our well-being is determined by how well societies uh, function. And so that is a, the second practical reason which has uh, driven the development of this science. 
Gotcha. Yeah, I did a little bit of looking before the show, as I always do, a little of my research. And historically, there have been various theories of history, as you point out. And some of the ones I found that were most prominent were the great man theory, which was popular, I think, in the 19th century in particular. And then in the early 20th century, the social forces slash structuralism theory, right? And then later, people like Jared Diamond, was it Germs, Guns, and Steel, something like that? And some others kind of brought forth an environmental determinism argument. And, of course, there's been a lot of argument, particularly about the last one, whether it's grounded in the data or not. How would you distinguish cleodynamics from those particular three previous models of what history is? First of all, let's talk about the influence of individuals versus more macro trends and mechanisms operating at the level of whole societies. Essentially, um, uh, my thinking is that we need to understand both. So we don't need to say that our theory ignores individuals or our theory only focuses on individuals. Because, uh, and this is an empirical question, how do we combine the role of individuals together with those uh, more uh, faceless forces together in order to get the best understanding. And also we can talk about prediction maybe a little later in the podcast. So how do we get the best theory that provides the best fit to data? All right. So the overruling question here is how do we get the best uh, scientific theory and what are the ingredients in it? So what distinguishes cleodynamics from other approaches is that other sciences like economics, sociology, uh, political science, they look at separate and different mechanisms, like, uh, economic mechanisms, uh, uh, po policy and politics and so on and so forth. But in order to understand uh, the dynamics of our societies, we really need to understand all of that, right? So cleodynamics essentially is an integrative science that takes into account economics and the politics and maybe climatology. It essentially, whatever is, uh, may have an effect, the influence of some individuals. Of course, this doesn't mean that we want to throw everything in the kitchen sink into our theory. This is where the empirical testing becomes very important. You want to include in the theory only those processes that matter for understanding and prediction, all right? And that is determined in an empirical way. So just to summarize, we, in principle, we are willing to consider any mechanisms that may increase our capacity to predict, but which mechanisms are included is decided as a part of the process of science where we test different uh, explanations and reject some in favor of others. Of course, history makes it difficult to do the gold standard of science, which is the double-blind experiment, right? We can't experiment with history, so we have to rely instead on data, right? Well, we always rely on data. But keep in mind that there are lots of sciences that cannot do experimentations. Let's take the golden standard of science, Newtonian mechanics. Well, you cannot do experiments. You cannot perturb planetary motions, or at least uh, Newton couldn't do it. Maybe in the future that we would be able to do it. So there are lots of sciences, especially historical sciences, such as astrophysics, geology, cosmology, revolutionary biology. So in many of this, and history too, in many of these sciences, we cannot do experiments. And therefore, we need to do something uh, different. But again, the core of science is testing theories against each other using data. And we can certainly do it with historical sciences like history. And you have led at least two efforts to regularize data. You know, one of the things that in history you point out that there's all these wonderful, smart historians that go and read Middle English journals from, you know, parish records and such and collate all this data. But for it to actually be used in a scientific basis, it needs to be standardized, regularized, and put into accessible databases. Talk about that process a little bit. Well, when I started uh, working in this field 
Initially, I was focusing on designing mathematical models. And why mathematical models? Because human societies are complex systems with interacting parts, nonlinear feedbacks, and therefore just verbal reasoning and unaided human brain cannot really solve forward the dynamics of our societies. We need the formal apparatus. But as I was working on translating different ideas about why societies, how societies evolve into models, I could not stop there because I've been trained to work at the interface between models and data, and therefore I wanted to test those models. And then it was actually quite a surprise to realize that there is much more data to test models about historical dynamics than we think. In fact, we are not limited to historical periods, that is, periods when we, for which we have records. There are plenty of data coming from archaeology and from many other sciences that can help us to test theories. So I'll give you uh, one example. That is the example that you mentioned. That example requires records. And essentially what I talk about this in my book this is a population reconstruction from records left in churches in uh, England since 16th uh, century. So we can trace actually several centuries of population dynamics in England and Wales. But there are other uh, sources of data. What is required is a search for proxies. A proxy is a, some kind of a variable that is closely correlated with the variable of interest. So, for example, one uh, big uh, process that we might talk about later in the theory that explains why end times come around is what we call popular immiseration. So how do we measure? How can we measure popular immiseration? Well, it turns out that one really reliable and accurate proxy of biological well-being is the average stature, the average height of a population. So at the individual level, how tall you are is uh, determined more by genes than by environment. But when you look at a population with a particular genetic uh, makeup, over time, it turns out that the average height reflects very well the conditions, the economic conditions under which people grow and age. So we can get uh, very reliable measures of average population heights from skeletal data. There are two millions of skeletons in uh, the European museums. So over the past uh, couple thousand years, we have an extraordinary good record of how the average height increased or decreased depending on conditions. And so one thing that we notice is that in the pre-crisis periods, the average population height tends to decline, indicating that the population is not doing so greatly. And that is one of the warning signals for potential troubles to come. Yep, that makes sense. I had a question about that, actually, because you also referenced it to the United States. And I was wondering if you controlled for ethnic mix, right? Ethnicities have different mean heights, even with optimal nutrition. I think Filipinos are, on average, the shortest people on Earth, at least of the major population groups, and the Dutch, I believe, the tallest. Did you have to do any adjustment for ethnic mix in the U.S. height data? Yes. We are fortunate that our data is detailed enough to make such adjustments. So in particular, for the United States, of course, the, one of the most important factors is race and, of course, sex. So we break down the data by uh, black females, black males, white males, white females, and we can trace those groups separately. But the data shows that um, all of those groups were affected negatively in the last 20 or 30 years. It is quite remarkable. In fact, it came as a bit of a surprise to me that such Malthusian uh, factors uh, would still be quite in play in our supposedly post-Malthusian world. <laughs> 
Yeah, that is surprising indeed. I raised my eyebrow when I read that. I mean, if anything, and I'm a good example, we're well overfed rather than underfed. And so there's something going on there. All right, well, this has been a good little dive into methodology and the idea of Clio dynamics. Let's now get into the actual arguments about end times and how we may be approaching them. At the highest level, at least what I extract from this, you talked about there are numerous candidate dynamics, but two really jumped out as the drivers from the data that could then be useful in models and back-tested with the data. And those are what you call popular immiseration, and the other is overproduction of elites. Why don't you tell us what you mean by those two terms, if you agree that those are the two base themes of your argument. If not, tell me what they should be. <laughs> No, no, you're, it's quite right. But So let me step back and tell you where these insights are coming from. Essentially, as you mentioned earlier, what we need in cleodynamics, uh, the critical part, is not just the ability to make models, but to test models with data. So we need as much data as we can get. And so over the past 12 years or so, I've been involved with a bunch of my colleagues in building large, even I would say massive, historical databases. This uh, project is called Seshat because Seshat was the deity of scribing and information in ancient Egypt. And as part of this project, we've been collecting data on past societies over the past 10,000 years. We've collected hundreds of societies. So currently, it's around between 500 and 600 past societies. More recently, we started a supplement, which we call Crisis DB. So this is the database of past societies sliding into crisis and emerging from those crises. So what does the database, this is a work in progress, but what does the crisis DB tell us? It tells us that large-scale societies organized as states have experienced good runs of internal order and peace for a while, for several generations, typically around a century, sometimes more, sometimes less. But those periods always end, unfortunately, with periods of social dysfunction, uh, political disintegration, and things like that. So the question is why? The first factor that is uh, ubiquitously observed is elite overproduction. Essentially, it's like a game of musical chairs, with uh, chairs representing positions of power in the society, and players representing elite wannabes, or the technical term elite aspirants. And in some situations, the number of elite aspirants begins to greatly overcome the number of chairs, the competition uh, between elites increases. Now, some competition is good, but excessive competition is, in fact, disruptive and dysfunctional. So what happens is that when you have twice, three times, four times as many elite aspirants as there are elite positions for them, the competition starts to undermine the social norms governing the political process. And we see people starting to break rules. And then eventually, uh, in past situations, all hell breaks loose and society may slide into civil war. So, in fact, this theory was proposed even before our own uh, end times. In 2010, uh, I published the prediction that in 2020, the United States is likely to uh, slide into a heightened period of uh, political instability. But in 2016, we saw the operation of this um, game of musical chairs in action. So in 2016, remember, there were 17 major candidates in the Republican primaries for the presidency. This was an unprecedentedly large number of players for a single uh, chair. And starting with one particular uh, player, and then it spread the rules started to be broken, and essentially the whole process became very chaotic. And this is a very typical situation that we see in other uh, pre-crisis uh, periods. Okay. Now, in, in the issue, let's talk about the immiseration first, and then we'll get to the elites. You use a calculation which you call the relative wage as an indicator. 
certainly at least for the later stage United States where things like GDP data was available. And you said it's nearly halved since 1950 or thereabouts in the United States. What's the importance of the relative wage versus the absolute wage? Because absolute wage has come up not a lot since 1975. In fact, it may have actually gone down for some segments. But since 1950, it's clearly gone up in an absolute sense, even though it's gone down significantly in a relative sense. Well, obviously, when we want to compare wages of American workers in, let's say, 1970s to today, we cannot just take nominal dollars. The typical thing that economists do is they calculate what's known as real wages. These are wages adjusted for inflation. However, uh, when you start doing that, how do you calculate inflation. Inflation is really different from uh, wealthy people compared to poor people because they use different uh, baskets of consumption, right? And so a single measure of inflation is uh, maybe misleading. Also, the uh, single measure of inflation may include things that people don't care as much about as they, as they care about other things. So what I uh, came up uh, with is what I call relative wage. It's simply wage in nominal dollars divided by GDP per capita also in nominal dollars. So by doing that, we exclude the role of uh, calculating inflation from this equation. Now, why is this important? It's important because it will help us understand why elite overproduction develops at particular phases of uh, dynamics. So think about it this way. Until late 1970s, the wages of not just unskilled workers, you can look at at, uh, different levels. I try to look at median wages and also the wages of uh, unskilled workers because you want to exclude the high earners because they are part of the elites. We want to know what is the economic well-being of the general population. All right, so the median wages have been increasing in parallel with GDP per capita. And many people have seen this graph, which is just really another way of looking at the same data, and that is the comparison between American worker productivity and compensation. And um, everybody uh, knows that until 1970s, productivity and compensation were growing really together, And then something happened. Uh, Productivity continued to increase quite well, but compensation stagnated and even declined. So this gap between the productivity or GDP per capita and uh, wage is an extra wealth that has to go somewhere. I, in fact, call it the wealth pump. The wealth pump is a perverse wealth pump that takes from the poor and gives it to the rich. And that's what happened uh, beginning from late 1970s. So relative wage declining means that workers stopped sharing in the general prosperity, and that prosperity went where? It went to the economic elites. All right. So the operation of wealth pump, we see it happen in previous societies. The mechanisms driving it are somewhat variable. So, for example, during the Middle Ages, the uh, population growth would result in overpopulation, too many workers for too few jobs, and that would depress wages. It would also increase the rents uh, that uh, peasants had to pay to landlords. And as a result of that, the uh, higher proportion of overall GDP would go to the elites. Now, in the United States, the mechanism starting the wealth pump was somewhat different, but the general mechanism is pretty much always the same. Essentially, what happens is that during this integrative period, periods of uh, high uh, internal peace and order, the elites, the ruling elites, tend to get used to the situation, and I think that uh, it's going to automatically go on as it has been before, and they are tempted to reconfigure economy in their own way, for their own benefit. And that's what really turns the wealth pump, 
and that leads to popular immiseration. Now, to come back to your question in terms of the drivers of instability, obviously, popular immiseration is a major driver because as people see that they are losing ground in the economy, that increases the discontent and uh, it uh, also gives rise to what we call mass mobilization potential because people are discontented, they can be mobilized by political entrepreneurs for all kinds of things like rebellions and political action against the ruling regime. Yep. I've actually also, when I was reading the book, I had an insight. I said, hmm, this relative wage thing might also be tied in to Rene Girard's mimetic desire and mimetic competition, where people see what other people are consuming particularly people better off than they are, and they want to emulate them. And there's a sense, a consumptive Veblenian competition around status symbols. And as the graph gets steeper, the sense of discontent around mimetic desire probably increases. So I went one level deeper and came up with that. What do you think about that hypothesis? Yes, exactly. It's that what people expect in terms of their levels of consumption is always relative. So it is useless to say that, oh, American poor are wealthier than uh, people living in Ghana. Or, or people sometimes hear people say, a welfare mother in Harlem is richer than Louis XIV because he didn't have TV and air conditioning, right? <laughs> so the, first of all, it's relative with respect to other segments of population. So seeing that one proportion of the population, let's say the proverbial 1%, is doing greatly, whereas you are losing ground. So that's one thing. But actually, more, even more important is the relative comparison between generations. Because how do people measure whether their well-being is what they expect or not? Well, you cannot measure your well-being against uh, Bill Gates because you really don't know uh, uh, what Bill Gates is consuming and what his level of consumption is. But what you do know is that what was the level of consumption of your parents because you grew in their household. So this turns out to be a, a very important factor. People grow up and they essentially fixate on what uh, at the level of well-being they expect and they are in fact uh, also get used that their well-being will be greater than their parents. So until late 1970s, what was happening was that every generation in America saw their uh, well-being increase in comparison to their parents. And after that, it stopped. And so it, in fact, got worse. I devote quite a bunch of pages in my book where I dissect what are the wages and how they have changed. And if you start uh, thinking about it, getting away from the generalized basket of consumables, but think about large-scale items that people need in order to be part of the middle class, that's, for example, right? So one of them is house. It turns out that the median worker has to work 40% more now compared to 40 years ago in order to afford a house. But even more striking is the comparison I do in terms of getting education. You talk about it. Getting education is one of the ways to escape uh, misery, escape precarity, as it's known. Well, if you grow up today in a working family, that is family that uh, does not have a college degree, your parents have to work nearly uh, four times as long to put you, their daughter or son, into college than back in the 1970s. 3.8 times. This is remarkable. I've done that calculation myself. You know, I came from a working class family and my parents paid me maybe a quarter of my way through college. I did the rest and got loans and worked and schemed and sold reefer, you know, all kinds of things. But I was able to manage it anyway, barely. But in real terms, after controlling for inflation, the cost of an MIT undergraduate education has gone up 4x since 1975. 
And I'm actually involved in one of the governance boards at MIT, so I actually see what's going on there. And I would say the product is no better, and if anything, marginally worse than it was in 1975. Unlike cars, you know, cars haven't gone up much in price in real terms, but they've vastly increased in quality. MIT's gone up 4x. And if it has any increase in quality at all, it's very marginal. If I would pass a guess, it's actually gone down a small amount since 1975. So, yeah, that's a very strange game. Again, in preparation, I went and did a little research and found some very strong confirming data about where I think we're going to go next with the discussion, which is the idea that not only is the pyramid getting smaller in some ways, but also way steeper. So the desire to ascend the pyramid has gone up. And I'm just going to give you some data points. You know, this one is relatively well known. 1965, the typical CEO made 15 times the factory floor worker. You know, these days it's more in 2021, it's 236 times, right? But it's not just in corporate world. These pyramids have gotten steeper everywhere. I looked at sports and I remember our Washington, D.C. sports hero of the mid 70s, Sonny Jurgensen. I think he was the second or third highest paid guy in the NFL. And he made $125,000 a year, which I just looked it up as 11x the median family income. 11x, you know, not so big. Lamar Jackson, the current highest paid quarterback in the NFL, makes $52 million a year, 742 times the current median family income. Marilyn Monroe was the highest paid movie star in 1960. She made about $100,000 a movie, which was 17 times the median family income of that era. Tom Cruise is currently the highest paid movie star at about $30 million per movie versus our 70K median family income. That's 428X. So this is a pervasive pattern. You know, there's a bulge in 1965, 1960, but now it's like this. The pyramid just goes straight up. So, you know, one of the things I took away from the book is that the call from the pyramid is now way stronger than it used to be. I think back in 1975, when I graduated from MIT, I didn't know anybody that went to Wall Street at all, right? They went into tech businesses. Not many were entrepreneurs in those days. A very few were. A few went to medical school. That was just during the time when the specialists in medicine were rising rapidly. But I didn't hear anybody even mention Wall Street. I don't know if people made a lot of money then or not. But in any case, it did not call to MIT undergrads. Today, it does, right? Because the pyramid is so steep. Oh, yeah, you can be a grade B minus trader on Wall Street, and make a one and a half million dollars a year, three years out of college, you know. And for some people, that's going to be very strong. So this extraordinarily rapid steeping of the pyramids got to have something to do with where we're at as a society. Yes, and it does in many ways, in fact. And this is all a result of this wealth pump. And that's why it's very important to separate typical or median uh, wages and salaries from the top earners. Because the top earners, it's, you know, in economists have a measure of the relative returns on capital versus uh, wages. And that's what they look at. But if you, in wages, you include the top earners, the, the, you're not getting the real story of what's happening on. That's why we need to exclude the top earners from our calculation. And you're quite right. This has been pervasive. The, the social pyramid has become top-heavy. And one thing we know from the study of past societies, that this is precisely what happens in the pre-crisis periods before societies get into civil wars and revolutions and, and things like that. The pyramid becomes uh, top-heavy. There are too many elites for the productive capacity of the society. And that's what leads to intraded competition and uh, eventually breakdown. And I would argue that, at least in some parts of the elite, not only has the pyramid gotten steeper, but it may have gotten smaller. I tried to track down the number of white-collar jobs in General Motors, and I couldn't find it exactly, but it looks like it's contracted by a factor of at least five since 1965. So just the number of chairs in the musical chairs game has gotten a lot less as we've gotten rid of middle managers and outsourcing has become a thing. And of course, automation is having something to do with this. The new AI large language model revolution is going to do more of that. So we get the combination of the pyramid getting steeper, and at least in some sense, the bottom of the pyramid getting smaller. Let me give you a historical example where precisely this happened. Let's go back to Western Europe 
in the middle of the 14th century. At that point, the uh, wealth pump was operating uh, quite powerfully over the previous century, so from 1250 to, roughly speaking, uh, 1340s. And what happened then, that uh, the Black Death came about, and it killed from one-third to one-half, sometimes even more of the population. And of course, it had a disproportionate effect on the poor, just as you might think about COVID effect uh, more recently. But the Black Death killed the poor at, in greater numbers than the elites. And so what happened was that the pyramid was already top-heavy because of the wealth pump operation. And suddenly you take half of the base away and the whole thing collapsed. And that's why we have 100 years uh, war in France, which was really a series of bitter civil wars in which uh, the English meddled. And then, of course, the English had their own uh, long, prolonged uh, civil wars known as the Wars of the Roses, somewhat later, where the elites were exterminating each other cheerfully. You know, the losing side in those battles, it was just like the Game of Thrones. I believe he based the Game of Thrones on the War of the Roses. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the losing side, the lords were uh, forced to kneel in the mud and their heads were lopped off. So this is one of the potential outcomes from the social pyramid becoming so top heavy. Okay, that's interesting. So now who are these elites, right? In one part of the book, you say, if you were an American and your net worth is in the one to $2 million range, then you were in the top percent, top 10%, which puts you in the lower ranks of elites. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, a million or two million, if you're my age, i.e. old, and you live in a major city and your house is paid off and you have a retirement account, if you're you know, the lowest end of upper middle class or the highest end of middle middle class, you probably have a net worth of a million or two million. Those people don't exactly seem like elites to me, right? Let's talk about the elites. Uh, so first of all, uh, let me give a more uh, proper definition. Elites, simply put, elites are a small proportion of the population who concentrate social power in their hands, right? And so think about uh, the historical examples include the Mandarin class in Imperial China, or we were talking about uh, medieval France, so military nobility in medieval France. All right. Now, the first point I want to make about elites is that typically, usually, there is no sharp boundary. So in the United States, you cannot say that there is uh, a sharp boundary between elites and non-elites. It's a pyramid, and therefore we can talk about the super elites, 1% of 1%, then we get to the proverbial 1%, and then the top 10% in wealth, all right? Now, why is wealth important? Because social power comes in four basic flavors. First of all, this is uh, military power or coercion. Secondly, economic power. Thirdly, it's political or administrative power. And finally, ideological power. Ideological power is the softest form of power, but it is extremely powerful in, in any case. All right, so in, in different societies, the ruling class tends to specialize in different kinds of social power. In our democratic capitalist societies, the governing elites are typically a coalition between economic elites and administrative or political elites. But the relative balance of power between those two kinds of elites shifts. So United States is actually unusual because we have the economic elites are um, much more powerful. In fact, they dominate. And that's, I make this argument in the book, and I, in fact, argue that the United States, by this point, is a, is a plutocracy, the rule by the wealthy. In other, let's say, Western European countries, like France, for example, that's where political administrative elites are ascendant. But come back to the United States, so because economic basis is so important for defining elites, as a uh, first-cut approach, we can look simply at the distribution of income. So that's what I do in my book. And that means that if you talk about the top 10%, all right, excluding 1%, so the 9% between 1% and uh, 10%, uh, 
What does it mean to say that, uh, you know, I am, for example, lucky to be in this group? What does it mean uh, to say uh, that I am the, uh, in the low ranks of the leads? I have enough power over my own life. I don't need to accept a job that I don't like. I don't need to move to a location I don't like. I can basically say, uh, go away, um, uh, you know, I'll do my thing. But I don't have a lot of power over other people. Now, when you get into the 1%, now we're talking about people who are the uh, officers in uh, large companies. Also, on the political side, we are talking about, uh, uh, you know, senators, you know, and uh, other uh, types of uh, political leaders and also in the administration. So those people have much more real power because they can order people around. And of course, once you get into the 1% of 1%, those are the people who have a lot of potential uh, power because they can uh, essentially swing elections uh, at local levels and even perhaps at the federal level. They sometimes own businesses which have hundreds of thousands of workers and uh, things like that. So keep in mind, again, ca coming back to the idea of the social pyramid, which is, I think, a very useful device for us to organize things. And so there is no sharp boundary. The higher you go in the, uh, the scale, the more power people have. And so now, as things have steepened, more and more people want to climb the pyramid, but there are no more seats, and maybe there are less seats than there were before. You come up with a very interesting concept, which you call it aspirant elite. And as I've started to write a little model on paper here while I was reading it, I said, this is actually very, very important. In fact, going one step further, I might call them the failed aspirant elite, right? And this reminds me of Eric Hoffer, who wrote the very famous book called The True Believer. And it was based on what happened in Germany in the 20s, where radicalism was growing rapidly. And Hoffer saw that a surprising number of people switched from being communists to Nazis and Nazis to communists. And, and if you took ideology seriously, you go, that's impossible. I mean, you can't be a Nazi on Tuesday and a communist on Thursday or vice versa. And yet his deep insight was the reality was the raw material for these radicals were what we called frustrated men. I apologize for the sexist language, but that was you know, of the time. And he described the frustrated man as a person who believed they were of high capacity, either rightly or wrongly, but had not achieved a suitable position in society commensurate with their own view of their own capacity. And so that strikes me that if we are generating lots of failed aspirant elites, that's got to be interesting. Well, uh, it's interesting and it's very dangerous because that's what undermines the stability of societies. So uh, let me uh, circle back to this question, but first do some groundwork. Remember that we were talking about the wealth pump. All right, so the wealth pump, first of all, it creates uh, popular immiseration and increases mass mobilization potential. Secondly, th but there are two other more subtle ways that uh, the wealth pump undermines the stability of our societies. The uh, first one of those is the overproduction of wealthy people. So what happened in the United States uh, over the past 40 years, the number of decamillionaires, so these are the people whose wealth is uh, $10 million or more in inflation-adjusted terms, by the way, right? The numbers of decamillionaires increased tenfold. The, the overall population grew by 40%, but the number of decamillionaires increased tenfold. And this is the result of this wealth pump uh, working at full speed. All right, so why is this bad? You might say, well, this is American dream. You know, people want to get wealthy, and uh, so that's all to the good. Uh, but the problem is that many of these people who have such wealth, they turn their hand to the political arena. So we think about Donald Trump or Michael Bloomberg or failed, uh, you know, uh, aspirants like Steve Forbes, for example. So there's quite a number of wealthy people that uh, decide to go into politics or, and others don't run themselves as candidates, but rather run other uh, candidates. So when we have 10 times as many people, we are now in that situation, but the number of chairs 
is still the same. It still have 100 senatorial uh, positions, one president, and so on and so forth. Uh, not, of course, everybody who has uh, substantial wealth wants to play uh, politics, but as you increase the number of this group uh, tenfold, the number who want to, uh, to, to take a hand in politics also increases quite substantially. And so we are now in this uh, game of elite uh, aspirant chairs. And what this means is that the more people aspire for such positions, and the position number stays constant, that means that the number of people who are frustrated in getting those positions blows up enormously. Yeah, exponentially. Right. And then again, not everybody of these frustrated elite aspirants is going to start breaking rules. But, but the more of them you are, the more of them will be breaking rules. So that's the second thing. But let me just get to the final outcome from the wealth pump. So by increasing immiseration, it also increases the number of people who live precarious existence, and it creates a very powerful push for people to escape uh, precarity. And how do you, if you don't have wealth, uh, how do you escape uh, precarity? You uh, get credentials, you go uh, get a college degree, but college degree nowadays is not really worth uh, much. So you get advanced degrees uh, such as uh, PhDs or MDs or law degrees. Now, law degree is a particularly interesting one because that's in the United States, if you want to become a politician and you don't have wealth, then you get a law degree and then you can enter politics. So what happened was that because of this push factor over the past several decades, uh, we have developed a situation where now we train three times as many lawyers as there are positions for them. And this competition between those elite aspirants resulted in pretty remarkable um, development, which is the bimodal distribution of uh, salaries of law school graduates. What it means is that maybe a quarter or so get very nice salaries, approaching two hundred thousand years per two hundred dollars per year. So those are people who are definitely entering the elites in all senses. But the majority, more than half, are trapped in with wages with salaries of between forty and seventy thousand dollars, which if you factor in that they typically have sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, that's not really enough uh, for them even to pay off those debts. So these are, uh, so that, that second bulge, uh, and nobody in between, uh, really, right? So that second bulge is the frustrated elite aspirants. They are intelligent, um, ambitious, uh, well-educated, uh, because they got the degrees, they are well-connected, and so they have a huge incentive to use those uh, skills uh, in order to get ahead uh, of the game. And therefore, these are the primary source of potential revolutionaries and radicals. Think about it. Lenin uh, was a lawyer. I was going to say, he fit perfectly, right? Right. Castro was a lawyer. Robespierre was a lawyer. You know, um, Abraham Lincoln was a lawyer, and we can think of American Civil War as a second American Revolution. So lawyers are the most dangerous profession with respect to a source of radicals. By the way, in the United States, Yale Law School tends to be the greatest producer of both the established elites and counter elites. So who are the counter elites? Those frustrated elite aspirants who decide to start working to overthrow the uh, governing regime, right? So Stuart Rhodes, for example, who is now in prison, of course, he's the founder and leader of Oath Keepers. He's a product of Yale Law Degree, and uh, quite a bunch of other people are. So counter elites are the ones who are extremely important in us understanding revolutions and civil wars because... Just popular immigration is not enough to really uh, overthrow the regime because they are not organized. You need organization, and organization is provided by counter-elites. So you put together the large numbers of uh, counter-elites together with popular discontent, and it's essentially an explosive mixture. 
Interesting. So you have the popular immiseration. Think of it as the fuel for the fire, right? And then the radicals, the frustrated aspirant elites who then become radicals. We'll talk a little bit about possible model for that. They ignite the fire. They come up with some ideology that happens to mimetically spread amongst the firewood, and off we go. And of course, as we know from our studies of complexity, including things like forest fires, the size of the fire from each spark might be unpredictable, but it's probably power law distributed. It is. In fact, we have data. If you measure the size of this instability events by the number of people killed, it's power law. Which basically means for the audience that big outcomes are a lot more likely than you'd think if you're thinking in Gaussian or you know standard statistical distribution terms. Just like I laughed my ass off when the financial crisis of 2008 came along and some idiot CEO, why such a person should be allowed to be a CEO of a financial services company, I don't know. He said, well, I can't be held responsible. This was a 16 Sigma event. <laughs> Which meant, essentially, it happened once in the history of the universe, maybe. And I said, no, asshole. It's a fat tail event that had a probability of about one in a hundred, right? You jackass, right? But anyway, such things are fat tailed. So now let me move on to some thinking I was doing when I was reading the book. So I was trying to push all these things together. Let's think of our current status quo system. I'm going to call it the core. is on an S-curve of some sort. And maybe the S-curve started flattening out in, say, the 90s, right? Like the need for more elites, for instance. And the wealth pump started working even more powerfully in the 90s, right through Democratic and Republican administrations. You know, there was no inflection during the Obama years other than those caused by the recession, but the trend line just kept roaring straight up. And yet, the educational signaling and the educational institutions have continued to grossly overproduce elites. Well, and then the pyramid gets stronger. So more people want to join the pyramid. You know, In my day, because the pyramid was flatter in 1975, we were less, frankly, concerned about money. We were more concerned about how much fun would the job be? How intellectually stimulating would it be when we chose our job? But when it's 10x, that might make sense. When it's 100x or 1,000x, you know, climb that pyramid, right? So you have this rain coming down. Kind of think of it like glucose falling to the bottom of the ocean. And down at the bottom here below the S-curve are a whole bunch of little startup S-curves, right? And they are getting fuel from these aspirin elites. And then they have the potential source of major breakout from the growing immiseration of the, the regular folks. And so there's all kinds of competitions going on. There's intra-elite competitions within the core, which we'll get back to talk about a little bit further. But then there's competition amongst the radical aspirant, little baby S-curves that are trying to get to the inflection point. Most of them fail. A few of them succeed. But at this point in time, they have more raw material to work with in terms of this huge number of failed or intentionally rejecting aspirant elites. You actually talk in your book about an example of a woman who clearly had potential from her family background or intellectual capacity who rejected all that. And you know, eventually, I think she went to Yale Law School or went to some fancy law school. But nonetheless, not with the intent to be a corporate lawyer like her father, but rather to go out and be a rabble rouser and maybe the next Robespierre. I don't know. So this sets up a very interesting set of dynamics. To some sense, that seems like getting kind of centered to the core of your story, why it looks like we should be living in interesting times over the years ahead. What do you think of that model? Well, yes. And just keep in mind, because there are different levels of elites, right? Lower rank, mid rank, and then magnates or high rank elites. So, and the competition is intensifying at all levels. So, at the lowest level, we have competition to escape precarity and get into 10%, all right, uh, or 20%, doesn't matter. And that's what drives a lot of internal competition amongst the college students and also PhD candidates or uh, other advanced degree candidates, right? But also at the highest level, we have increased competition between uh, the billionaires. We are lucky to have now just, uh, what was it, last week when Elon Musk and Zuckerman decided that they want to have a duel, <laughs> fight it out in the cage. Well, this is kind of interesting because in cruder times in the past, 
dueling was in fact a very reliable indicator, at least in the Western world where it was cultural uh, norm, of increased intra-elite competition. We see numerically, we see a much higher number of duels both in the mid-19th century during the age of revolutions and in the 17th century during the 17th century crisis. Nobles were slaughtering each other with both firearms and swords, essentially. So this is the way that intra-elite competition can actually become quite uh, bloody, right? So, but back to the question. Uh, yes, you're quite right. We see uh, increased intra-elite conflicts at all the different uh, levels um, in that uh, top layers of the pyramid. And what does your model tell you, if anything, about where the big risks come? Is it the intra-elite competition at the top? Is it the little new radical S curves down below and one of them catches fire based on a power law distribution of a spark starting a forest fire? What do you see as you peer into the data with respect to what's ahead for our society? Where are the probabilities of major inflections likely to come from? Or is it a portfolio of probabilities that you don't know where it's going to land? Well, the problem is that this all at different levels, they all work synergistically. So think about uh, previous um, revolutions. You need, obviously, the supreme leaders, but then you need officers, so to speak, and then you need foot soldiers. And so right now, as I said, because intra-elite competition is high at all the different levels, we are s supplying supreme leaders, uh, officers, and foot soldiers to uh, potential radical movements. So, in some sense, the potential energy is building up in the system, right? To use an analogy, not, not quite a literal sense. Now, I'm going to turn a little bit, which is we're talking about big trends, huge forces building up, and I can see it, I can feel it. But on the other hand, there's also idiosyncratic or special local factors, right? When I was thinking about America in particular, what spark would be more likely to spread than others? And that has to do with kind of local memory, local conditions. And I came up with two. On the right, if I were to hazard a guess, and this is just a guess, if there's going to be a revolt on the right, it's going to be caused by some overreach by the government around guns, right? Guns are sacred on the right, and they're also sacred not on the right, but they're particularly sacred on the right. And so let's imagine a a really horrific, worse than anything we've seen before, mass slaughter by three people with AR-15s. You know, Biden overreaches his constitutional authority and tries to confiscate all the AR-15s. Instant civil war would be my prediction. On the left, it probably has something to do with race. Let's imagine some horrific racist alt-righters slaughter a whole bunch of minority groups using AR-15s, let's say. Those so two could come together, right? And produces a revolution or, re or attempted revolution revolt from the left, kind of like Black Lives Mattered, but times 200. So how do you think about these forces building up from these macro trends versus the specific idiosyncratic attributes of a given society? Yeah, this is a very important question. But keep in mind, and here we're getting into the issue, since we're talking about the future, right, we are getting in, in, into the issue of prediction. My view is that human social systems are to a degree predictable, but ultimately unpredictable. But what do I mean by to a degree predictable? Some aspects of them. So the structural processes, such as immiseration and elite production, they tend to increase or change slowly over the period of years or even decades. And they are uh, fairly predictable because uh, the wealth pump, once it starts operating, it is producing all those outcomes. But then um, we know from the study of previous revolutions, you've mentioned the idea, this was actually Mao who said a spark could start a prairie fire. All right. So we distinguish between uh, the structural trends that undermine the stability societies and then the specific triggers. And these triggers come in a variety of um, ways, and they are essentially unpredictable because some triggers are, could be assassination of the ruler. Another one is simply a geoeconomic effect where suddenly the prices of food 
become very uh, high, which was a factor contributing to the Arab Spring, by the way. And the French Revolution, as it turned out. And the French Revolution, precisely. So then there could be uh, things like self-immolation of uh, Mohammed Bouazizi in, in uh, Tunisia, all right? And again, this was a spark that started the prairie fire. So essentially here, certainly given the state of our science now, maybe never we will be able to predict those things, especially if we believe in uh, free uh, human will, all right? So uh, we can speculate and what the scenarios that you are proposing, uh, they have the validity, all right? But predicting what kind of trigger would actually uh, set the avalanche off is, in fact, almost impossible to predict. So my favorite potential trigger is, that's why I'm worried about 2024, the elections. So we are uh, getting to the point where Whoever wins in 2024, the other side will not accept it. And then if you throw some additional triggers like the ones you mentioned, which set off the avalanche of violence, right? Violence and counter-violence. That is extremely uh, dangerous. In fact, Americans on both left and right have been talking about seceding. And this secessionist talk is getting intensified. And also the rhetoric is, you know, remember when... Trump was indicted, he was arrested and then released on uh, bail. Several um, right-wing figures were using very violent uh, language. To, and this is dangerous because this is what we see in history. Most humans, except for psychopaths, it takes a while to get us to start committing violence. There is a lot of inertia. And what happened in the previous runs up to uh, a revolution of civil war is that the level of rhetoric kept increasing. It became more and more violent, and then it spilled into the actual uh, violence. And that is, unfortunately, the trajectory on which we seem to be now. So to just to summarize, we can um, speculate about specific triggers and how things might actually break and when. But in reality, this is the least predictable aspect of how societies function. That makes a lot of sense. So imagine the grand forces producing lots of fuel, but which particular spark fires it up is hard to tell. So we have just a few minutes left here, and you do speculate a little bit in the book about what can be done. So let's turn there and talk about it. I'm going to pose two different classes of what can be done. One, we are in a very fuel-intensive situation today for reasons that you laid out beautifully. How should we be thinking about mitigating the fire risk over the next few years? And then secondly, what can we do as a society to reduce the production of fuel, so to speak, the longer term trends that we ought to be thinking about potentially as what we do next as a society so that we aren't building up more and more and more firewood and fuel waiting for the spark to set up a configuration. So number one, short term, number two, longer term. Yeah, this is, these are all great questions. But let me say first that the state of our science is not yet good enough to be able to really answer these questions. So I believe, and I have argued in the book, that the structural demographic theory specifically provides us a very good guide with how societies get into this crisis. And it it turns out that the road to crisis is fairly generalized. It's like a ball rolling down a narrow valley. And once you get to the crisis, it's a cusp, and a whole different set of avenues opens up. This is primary driver of why we are collecting crisis DB. We need uh, lots of cases to first statistically characterize the roads out of the crisis, and then try to test a variety of theories about why some societies chose better routes and others chose Worse rights. So, first thing I want to have is to, we really need to invest much more in building this uh, science. All right, now, specifically to your questions, this is a good way of thinking about it. In fact, let's use a historical example. I talk about the Chartist period in UK, so this is the mid 19th century. British Empire was the only large European state that avoided the revolutions of 1848, all right? And the question is, 
how did they manage to do it? And by the way, they were really in a very dire situation because, for example, the real wages of English workers were declining for a century prior to, you know, 1830s and 40s, even though the country has already started on the industrialization and the GDP uh, was growing very rapidly, but uh, it did not uh, percolate down to workers. So the story actually illustrates both the short-term and long-term solutions that the British elites managed to implement. In the short term, what they did, well, they were lucky because they had the British Empire. So they, first of all, they shipped millions of surplus workers to places like Australia, and some of them emigrated also to North America. And that reduced labor oversupply and helped to reverse the wages, uh, the, the wages started uh, growing. So that was one thing. The secondly, even more importantly, they had huge numbers of surplus elites, and they also shipped them to positions in the British Empire. So those short-term things worked because they essentially they flattened uh, the curve. They gave more time for the elites to uh, come up with long-term solutions. And the long-term solutions were they shut down the wealth pump by, first of all, expanding the suffrage, expanding who could vote in elections that they became much more democratic. They gave workers uh, formal power to organize and bargain. So that was an important thing. And then there was like a mini wealth pump uh, known as the Corn Laws, the corn laws was essentially the landlords who grew uh, wheat and other um, uh, food. They dominated uh, parliament and they passed the laws which basically shut down the importation of cheap wheat from uh, United States, from North America. And this is a wealth pump because they grew the food and then they sold it to their workers. Their workers had to pay twice or three times as much for the food. So essentially, this uh, mini wealth pump was taking the money from the poor and giving to the rich. And so uh, abolishing these corn laws had an immediate effect on real wages because food was the important part of the basket of consumables. And soon as the price of food went down, the real wages went up. All right. So what does it mean for us? We don't obviously, we live in a different country, different times. There is no corn laws, for example, for us to uh, to abolish. What we have is the general guidance. We need to shut down the wealth pump. And that is what will, in the long term, rebalance the economy. And this will take a little time, but our uh, social pyramid will become less top-heavy uh, after a number of years. In the short run, there are many things uh, we could speculate of doing, but one obvious thing to do, and I still don't understand why the democratic president in power today has not done it, that's increase minimum wage, All right? So we know that minimum wage does not hurt employment. This has been shown. The economists now generally agree on that. Um, and why it hasn't been done, it's unclear to me. And there are other things. For example, you know, well, now speculating. Uh, and I know when I say this, uh, many people will criticize me. But um, we could take, uh, we, we spend nearly trillion dollars a year on the uh, military and other uh, budgets. We could take one part of it, of it and simply employ, I would love uh, to give more work to historians, for example, because I have a vested interest in that, because they churn out very useful data, right? I'm, I'm circling back that we need to get our science of history better, and for that we need to have more and more data. And so employ those tens of thousands of PhDs of history that will reduce the degree of desperation uh, amongst them. And you would be removing quite a lot of potential counter elites from the equation. Okay. Yeah, maybe. I think the second one, the longer term ones may be stronger. A bunch of historians, I don't think that's going to stop the short term problem, but it might help a little. The longer term, obviously, reducing the wealth pump is huge. And we do have the history of that, you know, the post-FDR consensus that ran through 
you know, 1971 or thereabouts that very high tax rates. People forget the tax rate in the United States in 1971 was 91% for incomes above $100,000, I think it was. And it was still in the 70s, in the 70% in the early 80s. And of course, there were more tax loopholes and such, so the people that weren't quite paying that. But high W-2 earners were paying that, you know, movie stars, corporate CEOs, et cetera. Those guys were paying. It was 1964. Until 1964, it was over 90% on top incomes. Correct, correct. And then it was in the 70s from 64 to 80, something like that. Then it went down to 29%, right? That was quite remarkable. That and, well, a bunch of reasons caused the wealth pump. Now, with the final question before we exit, and this is going to turn it completely around, which is, Maybe it's a good thing that we have a revolution and that the periphery overthrow the core and that the core is rotten. The core does not know how to exist in balance with Mother Nature. The core is driving us crazy, as indicated by the mental health statistics, by deaths of despair, etc. The propaganda machine is becoming smarter and smarter and being able to manipulate us into buying shit we don't need. So maybe it's a good thing that the ecosystem is such that the fuel has built up and that there will be more sparks, and that there'll be cadres to lead a revolution if necessary. Let's take my hypothesis. And one, what do you think about it? And two, if you agree or if you don't agree, what are the ways forward to have a revolution and minimize the harm along the way? So I I disagree because people who have not lived through violent revolutions or state collapses, they just don't understand the amount of human misery that is. Um, I, I grew up in the Soviet Union. I left Soviet Union in 1977. And then I went back uh, in early 1990s and I saw the failed state and uh, the huge amount of misery there was um, in uh, the, all the different civil wars in the post-Soviet period. And in fact, the war in Ukraine is also an outcome of that. And it is a, it's a horrible uh, thing to do. So that's one thing. Secondly, uh, many uh, violent revolutions don't really make situation better because they just exchange one team of scoundrels with another. So I am definitely anti-violence for those two reasons. So we do see f- favorable outcomes. They are not typical. Only 10 or 15% in the past of, of our crisis were resolved in um, a less bloody way. Depending on what you mean by revolution, if we can have peaceful revolution without people getting killed, the result of which the needed set of reforms and policies will be implemented, I'm all for that. But violence is definitely both uh, bad on its own um, and counterproductive. So uh, we should really uh, learn the lessons from societies that manage to do it in a relatively peaceful way. Yeah, I certainly agree that violence is not a good thing. And the other thing is once the cascade of violence starts and gets above some threshold, where it ends up is really hard to say, right? Think about the Russian Revolution. How many people died in 1917, 1918, 1919, et cetera? And then it led to the killing of the Ukrainians by Stalin, on and on and on. On the other hand, as you say, there have been some peaceful or middle in cost revolutions. Like one of the ones I like to point to as a successful one was the Glorious Revolution in England in 1688, where it basically went from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy as the result of an intra elite competition, essentially. And the reason, by the way, is because many people who who lived during the Glorious Revolution, they still remembered what happened in the Civil War. So they knew how horrible things could get, and they took steps to avoid the worst. And similar, you mentioned the New Deal. In fact, um, this whole period from the progressive era, right, the first uh, two decades of the 20th century, into the 1930s, it took several decades to reformulate American society. And it was a big help that some people still remembered the American Civil War of 1860s. So this is very important, this factor of memory, uh, which we, unfortunately we don't have now. And that's why I'm worried about things uh, really getting out of hand. The cascade of violence you mentioned can run into much worse outcomes than people can imagine because of the dynamical nature of such things. Yeah, and of course, talk about other relatively low-cost revolutions. American Revolution wasn't costless for sure, but on the scale of things, big positive change at some cost. 
And unfortunately, the downfall of the Soviet Union took a very bad turn for all kinds of contingent reasons, some of them probably the fault of the West, some of them the nature of Russian culture. But one could have imagined that one having turned out differently, maybe, and it had been a clear net positive. You know, if somehow the liberals had been able to hold on, if Yeltsin hadn't foolishly appointed Putin as his successor, etc. And that would have been a very amazing example. Here was one of those horrible engines of evil, the Soviet Union, that collapsed from its own contradictions and then was supplanted by something clearly better. It seemed like that was an available trajectory, but somehow they didn't fall into that. I grew up in the Soviet Union, and by the time when I grew up, it was not an evil empire by any means. Life was getting better for people. And in fact, uh, maybe the Chinese route, which was to abandon communism uh, you know, in favor of uh, capitalism would have worked better in the Soviet Union than the state collapse that, in fact, occurred. Uh, I guess we'll wrap it right there. This has been a fabulous conversation. One of my intellectual heroes, Peter Turchin, who I've been reading very carefully for a number of years. It's been wonderful to have this conversation. And if people want to learn more, go out and read End Times by Peter Turchin. As always, there'll be a link on the episode page at jimrutshow.com, and I'm sure there'll be links to some of his other books as well. So thank you, Peter, very much for this deeply insightful conversation. Thank you, Jim. I really enjoyed the conversation also. Audio production and editing by Andrew Blevins Productions. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.